Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone and welcome back to the last day, the last third day of the UN SDGs uh, symposium, exploring the diversity of Athens. Uh, for the sake of the people in the audience that were not there the previous days, I would like to say a few words about the symposium. This uh, three-day online symposium follows the representation of the American College of Greece in the UN Millennium Fellowship Program of 2020 uh, by 11 degree students. Uh, it is organized by the UN Millennium Fellows and the ACG uh, Office of Public Affairs as part of the cohort's collective projects. The symposium aims at increasing awareness about the UN Sustainability Sustainable Development Goals and furthering the social impact on campus, focusing particularly on four SDGs. SDG 10, Reduced Inequalities, SDG 5, Gender Equality, SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, and SDG 12, Sustainable Consumption and Production. This symposium is an essential part of the sustainability efforts of the American College of Greece, and it delves into these four SDGs uh, through panel discussions that uh, are uh, uh, in which part the notable academics and experts participate, uh, and they are going to present hands-on solutions. The symposium is held under the auspices of the United Nations Academic Impact, the Millennium Campus Network, and the Millennium Fellowship Program, and is supported by the DRE Psychology Society, the DRE Sociology Society, and the DRE International Honors Program Society. Now, this first panel of the day will focus on SDG 12, Sustainable Consumption and Production. The guest speakers will engage in a discussion on sustainable consumption and food waste, presenting solutions for the reduction of food waste in the city of Athens, addressing the environmental, social, and economic aspects of uh, food waste. Food waste is an issue that is really a priority in the uh, European Union, and there have been several policies, like the Farm to Fork policy, that aim to reduce, reuse, and compost and use uh, food, and to promote the circular logic in uh, the economy and society. At the same time, uh, promoting uh, both environmental and social concerns. There have been several promising initiatives in this field, uh, implemented in all EU member states, including Greece, uh, by different bodies uh, like NGOs, but also municipalities. A notable uh, initiative is um, it's actually not only one, it's a set of initiatives undertaken by the municipality of Heraklion, uh, which uh, uh, has taken initiatives to reduce reuse and uh, also uh, compost um, food waste and so promote the circular economy logic in the regional food system. So today with us, we have representatives of three NGOs and an expert on food systems with experience in the municipality of Athens. And they will present solutions uh, that they have uh, implemented with the aim to reduce food waste We'll discuss the new challenges that we have to face after the pandemic and will help us understand the issue and the food waste challenge in a more holistic manner. So before we actually start the panel presentations, I would like to kindly ask the panelists to respect the time frame we have, which is nine minutes to 10 minutes maximum per presentation, so that we have time for discussion. And in the meantime, uh, the members of the, uh, the participants, the members of the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, uh, put them in the chat and they will be addressed at the end as time permits. So uh, starting, I would like to give the floor or the microphone <laughs> to uh, V. Buhani, who is the CEO and founder of Sustainable Food Movement Greece and founder of Food Team. V is a social entrepreneur and a sustainable culinary arts consultant since 2013, while she has worked with the UN for promoting a food waste strategy for the hospitality industry. She has also been trained and has worked as a chef since her early 20s. Diverse experience, that's good. Her greatest passion has always been food and she has focused career-wise on sustainability in the culinary and hospitality industry, regionally and internationally. She has studied cultural and creative industries at King's College London. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon and thank you for having me on this panel. Um, 
good afternoon to all. I hope you are not that bored during this second lockdown in Athens. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be among other uh, food experts as well today. And as the panel uh, session is about diversities, diversity, diver diverse cities and sustainability, um, I'm going to add a little bit more on how we should provide solutions and tips once we are uh, out of this pandemic, once we will be in a post-COVID era. So uh, to start my talk, I would like to say that we cannot ignore two facts that have been occurred during this pandemic. And the one is uh, the um, shock effect that the demand we ha we've seen on demand and supply. And the other one is the increase on the online food demand, which is up to 80% globally. Um, during this pandemic as well, we've experienced strong uh, fluctuations and very short-term uh, changes on eating habits. We've been experienced as well a uh, food waste reallocations. For example, comparing to last year, December 19, we've seen a 12% increase on food waste uh, in households. And then again, we've seen the massive uh, food supply disruption, chain, food supply chain disruption, uh, because of the closure of restaurants and hotels. So my main question when I talk about food waste in a post-COVID era lately is like um, if the COVID-19 uh, is proved to be the catastrophe of the food waste that many feared, or if COVID, this pandemic, is, um, can be the catalyst for the new era of transparency. And today I'm going to talk mostly about transparency because I believe transparency and diversity go hand uh, with hand. So, um, and I, I'd like us to think of how transparency and diversity can provide uh, solutions to food waste. So, uh, from a consumer's perspective, as all of us, we are consumers. And because we, you've mentioned the um, farm to fork strategy and the new green deal, I'd like to see governmental support towards the farm to fork strategy, not only uh, in public sector, in private sector as well. So we would like as consumers to see restaurants and hotels and coffee shops and baker shops and anyone who is uh, selling food to be able to apply um, a holistic approach on green practices as well. Um, so I would like to see protected food markets and small farmers as well. I'd like to see uh, efficiency packaging on food because it's really important for transparency reasons that we're going to talk a little bit later on. I would like to see as a consumer low cost uh, and to avoid high cost escalations on food prices and generally to see fair pricing from now on. Um, local authorities as well, they should promote a, a set of tools that interconnect um, all members of the supply chain. For example, we had this, um, since the last um, lockdown, we had this um, talk about how municipalities uh, could add on to this fight against food waste. And one major, for us at least, uh, tool is to at least decide to set um, and design as well a proper canteen service and maybe for Greece this is not um, something that people can believe in but I still think that a proper design canteen service for any school for any public or private school where meals are provided for free to kids any kids no matter if you are having food insecurity or not it's very important to affect the diversity of cutting the future. And it's a nice way to contribute things that are going to waste anyway. Uh, so I'd like to see a policy infrastructure really aligned with the farm to fork strategy, aligned with the effects of uh, the sustainable development goal number 12. Uh, from the perspective of, uh, profess of professionals and the perspective of uh, enterprises, because um, I'm a social entrepreneur and I'm running a startup and we have uh, all the time discussions with clients and, and, and colleagues. Um, the transparency issue that I mentioned at the beginning is related to reporting. 
So I would like to suggest that we need governmental guidance, support and consultation. All enterprises in the food industry should, should start report food waste and they should start doing it legally and clearly. And I know that my industry, um, when it comes to transparency, they are, um, um, they are, they are not very keen into uh, being able to share data publicly and uh, they're uh, dragging its feet from the transparency issue but it's about time once we have the farm to fork strategy governmental support to uh, we need governmental support to start doing it so so it's uh, it's on it's not only suggesting that consultants like myself for example I, I don't want to be in the position to propose all the time that you should report you should report it's something that should happen and it's something that should pass on as a uh, as a policy um we should uh, look uh, we, we had the chance during the first lockdown to collaborate with uh, partners from abroad especially from the states and the uk and we had the chance to um announce two manual guides for enterprises about how they should reopen right especially restaurants and hotels and we gave a few tips on what the hotels and what restaurants should do and we we, we stick into the circular economy model not only because we are running a new initiative for 2021 but because we believe sharing food is um the sharing uh, economy uh, model can apply to food as well so um the, the transparent um, the transparency as i mentioned before it's essential uh for these uh, circular economy and sharing uh, economy models and once we have efficient reporting as i mentioned before then technology can give us uh, faster solutions because we will have data and we will know as well uh, what consumers need how they uh, reacted and what they how they're going to spend their money so we will have new data that will help us to understand how we should uh, tackle food waste generally and i'm talking uh, and i'm talking i'm saying this mostly because from the side of uh, a restaurateur or a hotelier who has who runs a business and who sells meals so this is very important for them because I understand that the redistribution of food is at the core uh, of uh, many food initiatives. Uh, however, sharing food, um, we should be more familiar with other, uh, when we are talking about sharing food, it's not only about food. It's about sharing our kitchens, sharing our kitchen devices. It's about sharing knowledge, expertise and skills as well. Um, so in a future city, in a city, in a few years from now on because 2030 is not far away um, in regards to municipalities and city managers i would like um, to to see um, those any municipality who is uh, doing green practices i would like to map out map map map, map the existing initiatives at, uh, on their territory as well so consumers and any one of us could be able to see what's going on what is the transparency behind uh, any action any activity and what kind of new uh, opportunities uh, can rise and be identified by public um i totally believe in synergies i totally believe that uh, the way we deliver food and the way we take food from restaurants and hotels has changed a lot um I believe in collaborations, but in collaborations that they have a common goal, they are designed under the umbrella of circular economy. Um, we are here as a startup, as an enterprise to educate restaurateurs and professionals in the kitchens to think differently. Uh, it's not about creating any food, any menu. It's not about selling one good meal. Uh, it's more than that. Um, so once, I don't want to keep you long because time is limited, once we are get used to this new normality and once we have, um, the we have at the moment we have the, um, the, the um, we are very lucky to think of how we should spend our money because our financial status is going to change as well. So once we are out uh, again and we're going to go and seek the experiences we had, we will be able, we will need to think that things cannot 
are there, there, there's no way back. Things have changed. Things have changed in the way we consume food in restaurants and hotels. And um, what I would like to say now is that um, uh, sharing economy and circular economy model are the only uh, two models that can be embraced by government and society and enterprises like us to provide solutions to tackle food waste. Because in the end of the day, um, we need to rethink of how we make money, how we spend money, and we want more than ever to be ethical. And that's that for me, actually. I think I was in time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for being uh, attentive to time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, comments also, uh, food for thought and for our discussion. Uh, the next uh, panelist is Alexander Theodoridis, who is a co-founder and CEO of Borume. Uh, hello. Hi. Alexander is one of the co-founders and director of the NGO Borume, a leading food uh, organization in Greece, which since 2012 has saved and offered more than 40 million portions of food from thousands of donors to over 600 charities over Greece. He has extensive experience in both the private and public sector, is a Marshall Memorial Fund Fellow and has received scholarships from the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung, I don't know German, so I may pronounce no and the DEAAD. Uh, he holds degrees from the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich uh, in uh, political science, economics, international law, and the London School of Economics and International Relations. So, uh, Mr. Theodoridis, <coughs> microphone is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I will switch directly to the presentation, if it's okay. Uh, uh, can, can you see it? Is, is it okay? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's, I will skip the part that uh, why we're doing what we're doing because I think uh, more or less it has been uh, obvious in the past years how big of a problem uh, food waste is. Actually, in the past years I've been saying in presentation it's with all the latest incoming data, it's actually uh, pretty impossible to exaggerate about how big it is. So uh, I will leave this whole part because, yeah, let's say it's one of the biggest and uh, most important uh, environmental and social and economic problems out there uh, in the world. I will go directly to uh, Borume, which means we can, to those who don't speak um, uh, Greek from our audience. Um, and we can, and what we can uh, is uh, save food. This is what we started doing uh, eight years ago. Um, just a, gun, a bunch of uh, people that uh, just wanted to change what we were uh, witnessing around us, a very, very negative oxymoron of, of very high food waste on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, uh, a, a rising uh, demand of uh, food. And this uh, negative oxymoron, we just wanted to reverse and change. And uh, the way uh, we started doing that was with a model that I will explain uh, in a moment. So our, our approach is, is, is a holistic approach uh, based on the reverse uh, food waste uh, uh, pyramid. Uh, and actually, uh, you can, you can um, uh, say that we have two pillars of, of, of programs and actions. One is the actual saving and offering of, of food, and the other one is uh, dedicated to awareness uh, uh, raising and education. Um, yeah, and what we are basically is a national network of collaborations. Uh, I say uh, always that we don't do anything on our own. We love to do create uh, collaborations with um, numerous partners. Um, always with one goal to reduce food waste. So uh, the programs we have created in the past years are the following. And as I said, you can you can uh, say that there are two pillars uh, of, of, of actions that we have in programs um, and then a few other programs that we run uh, as well. Um, so this is uh, our basic model, um, the saving and offering uh, food model that we created without knowing that the, it didn't exist anywhere in the world when we did it. Um, it's basically a, a, an immediate, uh, direct uh, connection between all of those who have something to give and all those charities that uh, every day give food to their um, uh, beneficiaries. Uh, we started uh, seriously by, by saving and offering 12 cheese pies. Uh, and now we have, uh, we have a running uh, daily average of 25,000 uh, meals from uh, all over Greece. 
Uh, the food donors, um, you can see, I've, I've listed a few, but actually is anything, anywhere, any, anybody you can imagine that has food uh, in surplus. And um, on, on the other hand, there are charities basically um, in three categories. You can, you can uh, say uh, you have the soup kitchens, uh, very often run by the church in Greece uh, on, a, on a neighborhood level. Then you have the municipal social services and then all the other welfare organizations that exist uh, in Greece. And what Borume does is actually create bridges between them and organizes the, the, the pickup of the food donation by the charity at the place uh, designated by the food donor. And that makes it extremely easy uh, for, for, for a company to, to uh, donate uh, food. And, and that's why uh, they've been doing it, uh, most of them, on a daily uh, basis. I have listed a few um, indicative bridges. Um, basically, anything you can imagine from, from anywhere in Greece, uh, we have already uh, saved and donated. Uh, this is really um, uh, just a few cases uh, for you to, to see. Um, the next program that we've created uh, in order to answer to the question, how can we save uh, and offer food at every stage of the food chain, is uh, the Borum at the farmer's market. Uh, basically, this started because uh, we were witnessing uh, so much food being wasted at the end of a, of a farmer's market. Uh, and uh, uh, we were also witnessing people um, really going to pick up that food from, from the street, uh, food that others have thrown away. So this was, um, this was something that we wanted to change. So we wanted to have an uh, organize a systematic way of saving this food and give it to beneficiaries, to charities, where the beneficiaries with... with um, uh, in a dignified manner, uh, could could receive this uh, food. So this started very very uh, humble as well, and now uh, it's in its fifth year of running, and uh, we have saved more and offered more than uh, close to 500 tons of fresh produce uh, to numerous um, uh, charities in Athens in uh, in Thessaloniki, with uh, hundreds of volunteers uh, helping us. Really, a, a fantastic program that is that that has kept growing and growing uh, all the time, and of course, uh, the the <coughs> where where food waste starts is actually uh, at the, at the field, and so uh, we created this gleaning program many many years ago, uh, with one purpose to to help a farmer uh, who would decide for 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 any reason, and there are many reasons, unfortunately, uh, that he would not be able to. Uh, harvest uh, his produce and then and, and sell it, we would come and say, unfortunately, we understand that you cannot do it uh, and we would love for you to sell it because this is the purpose of your undertaking. But, okay, it happened. Uh, you will not be able to do that. Let us help you. Instead of throwing this away, let us help you harvest this food and give it to a nearby charity. A, a beautiful program, a fantastic experience. Uh, we always look uh, forward to doing that every year. Um, unfortunately, uh, this has not uh, become as big as it could have because of uh, practical issues such as um, the fact that uh, agricultural production in Greece is not very industrialized, uh, which means that um, you're dealing with, with a one-man show very often. Um, our latest program that we have created in, in is in the middle exactly of these two pillars, because it, it steps on both pillars, uh, both the saving food pillar and the awareness raising pillar. And uh, we are very happy um, that a uh, few uh, weeks ago, we officially um, uh, announced the start of um, the Alliance for the reduction of food waste. Everyone uh, is, is invited to, to everyone who is, um, has, a, has a stake on food waste uh, in Greece today is invited to come and participate. Uh, this is basically, and the, one of the most effective tools we have witnessed uh, on a European level and international level um, that can bring together everyone involved and, and create um, synergies that no one would have imagined before um, around one table and, and, and discuss uh, and analyze what is going on in Greece uh, and then look upon specific ways to reduce waste in a very, very substantial and daily um, manner. So this is under the auspices of the Ministry on, on Environment. At this point, I would like to um, inform you, uh, because uh, Ms. Bugani mentioned it before, about the policy alignment with the Farm to Fork strategy. Uh, we are very blessed to have been helping in the past few months 
um, um, the, 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 the ministry uh, in, in, in order to incorporate the, um, the European law 851, which has to be incorporated into national law. This actually should have been done months ago, but nevertheless, it will be done uh, now and probably next week uh, uh, it will be uh, posted on for, for a national um, uh, a deliberation. Um, we have been trying to help them to, to with our knowledge from, from other countries in Europe, uh, uh, to bring this, uh, this uh, law in, in the best uh, and most suitable uh, way. Um, so lots of work and, 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 and we, you are all invited to participate in that. Uh, we will break uh, in the coming uh, weeks. We will break into specific workshops that deal with the most important issues of, uh, of cross-sexual uh, issues of food waste, such as food labels, um, fruits and vegetables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we go to the second pillar, which is the awareness raising program. Uh, we have been uh, we have been um, uh, running campaigns and, and events uh, in the past years. We were the first ones to do. Uh, public uh, awareness raising campaigns in Greece uh, on this issue, uh, very often together with our friends from the WWF. Um, we have several programs uh, running into that, but I will not uh, stay on this. This is very important, uh, and this is ongoing, of course, all the time. Uh, through this program, and because many, many teachers were inviting us to come and speak to their uh, students, about food waste, we created together with the um, following the advice of uh, friends, academic friends, we created, um, uh, we were the first ones to create an educational uh, program for uh, food waste uh, in uh, for Greek schools. This has been, ex been expanding every year and now the curriculum is really uh, very, very beautiful and very rich. Um, it it um, applies to every age uh, from, from kindergarten uh, to three stages of um, elementary school and then high school and Lycion, of course. Um, we are very uh, proud that we've talked to more than 20,000 kids in the past few years. Um, this is, for me, the most beautiful, okay, this is one, this is very um, uh, subjective, but also uh, the most uh, substantial thing, if you want, from everything that we're doing regarding food waste, because this is where you say, okay, I'm, ch I'm trying to rewire uh, young minds in order to, you know, um, uh, diminish food waste for good uh, in, in the future. And it starts with, uh, with these ages. Um, these are other programs uh, that we have uh, created. Not so important. I will stay uh, with uh, some results that we have um, uh, in the past years as, as Borume. You can see that we have saved and offered more than 40 million portions of food since 2012. Uh, we are very proud that um, uh, we, we have kept improving um, the, the productivity uh, of, of, of our model. And now for every one euro of operational cost for Borume, uh, we save and offer more than 50 food portions. Um, that, was, uh, that was at the beginning of 2020, now it's even higher. Uh, only in the past year, we had more than 500 volunteers. You can see in a total of more than 3,000 volunteers have, have been blessed to have their help. By the way, I didn't mention uh, the Borumet Laiki program that uh, the American College of Greece has been very, very uh, supportive um, by uh, adopting uh, one farmer's market. Um, and by adopting, I mean that uh, the American College of uh, Greece is providing the volunteers, and we're very happy for that and, and thankful. Uh, volunteers, students who go uh, to a specific uh, farmer's market close to the campus and then they go into the farmer's market and save and donate everything to a, a nearby charity. Uh, so we have helped more than 600 um, charities all over Greece. Um, we are very, very blessed uh, to have been chosen by the European Commission to be a member of the a founding member of the EU platform of food waste and food loss. Uh, this is where um, the who is who of food waste in the European level gathers. And this is where we, we gather a lot of knowledge about where the whole issue is going, what is happening in other countries, what could we um, bring to Greece. Uh, and one of these things that we are wanting, uh, we, we wish to expand in the near future in order to be even more holistic in our approach of food waste is that... Um, 
uh, we were we are very seriously thinking now into creating social enterprises that will take a, a, a surplus food because uh, there is a lot of surplus food even after all of our actions and all of our food saving there is a lot of food to be saved there and a lot of food that is being wasted so we are going now into the next uh, pillar if you want to say if you want to uh, say it like that into the third pillar of our actions where we will create a specific um, specific new uh, uh, social enterprises in order to um, upscale uh, all the food that is being um, actually wasted day by day uh, in Greece uh, still. So thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to be as quick as possible in order to uh, respect uh, the time given. Um, thank you. And thank I don't know, much. the questions will be at the end, I presume. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank uh, you. I want to thank you for uh, giving us uh, very concrete ideas as to what uh, we can do and how we can help in this uh, whole food system uh, in order to make it more uh, sharing yeah. and sharing. Yeah. Uh, there are more, but there was not time. <laughs> yes, but uh, very, very interesting insights. So thank you very much. Thanks. Very practical too. Thank so you. now I would like to uh, invite um, Mr. Costantinos Majeras, who is the executive director at the organization Earth. Uh, hello. Uh, Kostalin is the Executive Director of Organization Earth, a Greek civil society organization that offers transformative learning on sustainable lifestyles and also organizes collective action of global citizenship. He is a member of the steering committee of SDG Watch EU, a European alliance of NGOs that aims to hold governments accountable regarding the 2030 agenda. He also serves as the General Secretary of the Regional Mediterranean Group on the International Federation of the Organization of the Organic Agricultural Movement. And um, generally, Kostandinos has been uh, uh, very active in many NGOs, in many roles, uh, president, member of the board, etc., uh, including the Hispanic Platform for Development, Action in Hellas, Global to Action in Poverty. The steering committee on UN Global Compact Greece. So, uh, looking forward to hearing uh, your insights uh, about. Thank you, thank you, for Professor, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, hello to all our audience. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I decided to, to wing it and not have a presentation, so maybe this will help the, the discussion among the panels as well. So. Um, uh, I, I thought it was um, my place to be here and have something to contribute because, as it already was discussed, I, I work for an organization called Organization Earth that back in 2010 uh, started offering experiential learning on the sustainable development. And one of the premises of our actions were that the problem of or the fight of achieving sustainable development, in our opinion, is going to be fought won or lost in the cities. So one of the premises of our organization is that in the cities we have lost contact that we are part of nature. So one of uh, the first and um, most proudest initiative of Organization Earth is that we created an environmental learning center, an open air one that we call the center of the earth. And in that uh, learning center, we also have a real organic, collective, urban, vegetable garden. So what we did is that we started back in 2012 inviting schools and uh, school children to come to the garden so we can start this discussion about knowing where our food is coming from. And being also city kids ourselves, that's when we realized that uh, along with the kids, we started understanding more about what food waste means and what are the different um, <clears throat> aspects and externalities. So one of the things we realized is that when you're growing up in a city, you usually have no idea how the food is produced or cultivated. So if you think about it, what uh, Alexa was showing was a potato that you usually don't realize that it's coming underground. And if it comes underground, it's going to be probably dirty, a bit lopsided, that carrots are never uh, orange or straight. And this is how we started discovering more aspects about food waste and how we even waste so much in terms of aesthetics. We even invited um, uh, farmers themselves to show us traditional ways of farming. And that's when we realized that this uh, buzz that we hear about circular economy 
it's not something new. It was the exact same way nature had um, already in place in what it means to grow your food. So in a traditional organic vegetable garden, you never have any waste because actually what is wasted, it's, what, it's the thing that creates the best um, fuel for the future, which is composting. Uh, the, the other thing is that we need to definitely find out about what Alexandros was saying about the social aspect. So it's quite important that this year the United Nations on the 29th of September actually celebrate the first day of international awareness of food loss. And the UN General Secretary called it outrageous that in this day and age, we still have 690 million people that don't know where their next meal is coming from when we actually produce so much food that it goes to waste. This is also something that I would like to talk though about the externalities, because we also need to remember that by wasting food, we waste so many natural resources that we don't have, uh, that they are scarce and we don't have for free. So when food is lost, all the resources that were used, the energy, the water, the soil, even the capital, goes to waste. And this is definitely not part of sustainable development. I know that the discussion here involves about uh, the sustainable development goals. Uh, and I wanted to mention that, that, of course, global goal number 12, responsible consumption, should be the fourth most in our discussion. However, you already understand that uh, goal number two about creating sustainable f food systems and creating healthy lifestyles is also important. But think also about global goal uh, 13, climate action, life underwater, because we forget that most of our food is actually coming from the sea. And last but not least, uh, land on uh, life on land. The last comment I want to make, because we have been working a lot with farmers lately, is that we also need to remember about global goal number eight and decent work. So we need to think about this new transition. And I know that um, a very good friend, Yoros Yeranis, is going to talk about it uh, afterwards. We need to think about this new transition and what it means about the people that are growing our food. So decent work for our farmers, especially the ones trying to go organic, which means creating healthy food for everybody without chemicals, but also without harming um, the environment, should be the priority for them to be able to live um, a prosperous life by doing this job. So last but not least, I want to say that in order to, to achieve this, we as organization Earth, we run a campaign which is called I Grow Your Food, because we think that we, the consumers, we have the responsibility that we mentioned about how we behave, the responsibility that Alexander mentioned about what we're doing, about the food waste, but also we have a responsibility to find more about the people, which are millions around the world, that are actually growing our food. So uh, we already mentioned about the synergies. We need to see this as a holistic issue. We need to see what are the externalities. For example, the farm to fork strategy that the European Union recently announced has many great uh, mentions about this, but we don't see enough mention in what happens in the primary sector and the supply chain. So my, life, my, my last point in order to keep the discussion going would be that we all need to come together and you for, for mostly as a younger generation and to start now discovering how we grow, share, consumer food, because we already know that this is not happening right now in a proper manner. Thank you so much, and I'm available for a discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for being uh, prompt, too, and a very, very um, insightful uh, presentation with uh, lots of issues to think about, uh, hopefully, they will help a discussion. So now I'll take the opportunity to remind everyone to actually uh, bring in questions for uh, the uh, presenters, the panelists. Uh, before I now talk about the next uh, panelist, who is uh, Yorgos Keranis, a management consultant food systems expert. Uh, he is uh, an organization and marketing management uh, professional with a particular focus on food systems. Uh, social entrepreneurship and organizational change. Since 1999, he has been involved in food systems operations in areas such as production, market, research, civic engagement, 
and public policy. He has specialized in the development of organic farmers markets in Greece and action learning programs through community kitchens, market research and strategy, and has introduced a sustainable food policy in the municipality of Athens. His academic background combines sociology and business administration at the University of Vermont and graduate studies in philosophy at the University of London, London School of Economics. So, Yorgos, please, um, you are close to the panel uh, with, I'm sure, very interesting points. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I think I'll try to, to get the presentation on, so let's see how we can do that and you give me feedback whether it works. Mm -mm -mm. So here we are, is it okay? Can we see it? Yes, yes we can. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, it's a full of insight uh, meeting that we're having. Uh, on my behalf, I would go a bit and focus where my expertise in with regard to food waste and food systems, and in particular with policy considerations that local authorities have to take into account. And uh, so, and as our theme is about sustainable consumption and food waste, we could start with seeing where Greece stands with regards to household consumption in terms of calories, and more or less the same is with proteins. So, in the UN FAO data in 2007-2008, we were number three in the world in calorie consumption, and this still seems to be the case, even though the crisis from years 2011 to 2017 seems to have been an incentive to reduce our consumption like there is no tomorrow. However, we're still top 10 in the world in our calorie consumption and protein consumption. So here comes an element of using food not necessarily as useful, but uh, as waste in our own bodies. Our bodies become the waste depositories of food. Uh, and this data is, of course, supported by the health ministry data on uh, overweight and obesity in Greece and diabetes as well. Uh, we could go a bit on the consumption model. And if you want to have a quick look at the numbers, the main idea is that uh, in the new Greek diet, which means from the 70s, 80s onwards, uh, we consume four to five times more meat than we should have been consuming according to the traditional Mediterranean diet. Uh, twice more milk and milk products, and the same goes with uh, sugars and oils. So we're generally on an overconsumption side of uh, in our diet. It's not really Mediterranean what we're doing presently. And we could consider how to change such things. Which takes us to the next step. We, according to EU evidence, households produce around 50% of food waste at a European level. I guess the same would hold for Greece. So once we have to deal with the consumption side, uh, it's important to find ways to make a transition to the to a zero food waste system and do it in a manner that does not create big problems. And what I mean by that, uh, there is always a positive and a negative side. So if we go, if we all of a sudden, all consumers would change their minds and start producing zero avoidable food waste at least, because let's say the unavoidable food waste is unavoidable, uh, we would uh, have big time change in the greenhouse gas emissions, in the land we use and in the water we spend, so they could be uh, channeled to much more productive and beneficial activities for the whole of society. However, since Presently, we depend on a food waste economic and developmental mo development model. Food waste is essential for the economy to keep working. Uh, and, of course, we can discuss about this at the 
discussion that will follow. The negative externalities would be that, okay, on the one hand, we had we would have a household uh, um, savings that would go up. It could help households not to spend that much money, but food production would go down because demand would decrease. So food prices would decrease as well, which means that the profitability and the sales of food processing and production companies and farmers would go down, which eventually would lead to a loss of employment at the, at the agricultural sector and the agri-food sector around 2%. Uh, now, the above is according to this fantastic uh, study, which is not the only one, of course, a waste won't not won't not a economic impact assessment of household food waste reductions in the EU. A similar study that was done in the with regard to the processing industry and if it managed to avoid food waste would also leads to some similar uh, conclusions, namely that in macroeconomic terms, we would have to face some externalities that are really negative presently. More or less, this reminds us, it's the whole, this whole thing about the fair transition, and in Greece, it reminds us of what happens with energy in Kozan, in Ptolemaida, where we are going to close down the carbon producing uh, industries. Uh, but we need to find a way that the people over there have a, still have employment, that social cohesion is on, and that you know that societies do not collapse. So, and this I believe takes me back to to what V. Bugani has said that we need to think of food waste in terms of circular economy at all stages of the food chain and the food system. We can definitely treat the symptom and try to avoid having food waste, redistribute food waste, and so on. It's highly important, you know, it's true that we have people below the poverty line and people throwing equal amounts of food. So we have to, in a way, in an ethical way, to, to help people who don't have access to food to gain access to food. Uh, however, at the same time, we need to do it in a way that doesn't blow up our society. So the agri-food, we, we need to find ways where the agri-food sector can benefit, employment is created, and social cohesion is reinforced. So I'll give three examples that relate to, to public policy with local authorities. Uh, the first comes from the municipality of Athens and also the municipality in Vuliagmeni, Vairi, and Vula that have adopted eventually during the past five to eight years a consistent policy on tackling food waste at the consumption level. And what happens with the municipality of Athens, in particular where I have more experience, I would say, is that we have started in 2013-14 with a, the LIFE program, the BioWaste, in cooperation with Kifisia municipality. Uh, that dealt with food waste at consumption level, at consumer level, uh, restaurant level, and the um, institutional level, like hospitals or the Ministry of Defense. Eventually, this program has become a, has been mainstreamed as a policy, but not necessarily with these three aspects, but mostly with uh, the flea market, the public markets, like Esagores, uh, just something for with Alexandros, they're not really farmers' markets. They're 50% farmers' markets, 50% traders' markets. So that's why we I insist on calling them public markets or like Esagoras as it is, it is called in Greece. Uh, so what happened since, since 2014 has been the collection from household uh, from households and the public markets, which started in 2018. And uh, we have reached the level of uh, collecting around 500 tons of food that could go to waste, which is turned into compost, and is translated also into a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. I wouldn't go into the numbers now, it would become too technical, and I don't know if we would remember everything. Uh, the next example that has to do also with the municipality of Athens is what is done now. It's happening not necessarily in the place of 
food waste reduction, but mostly in social welfare, where Kiada, the social service organization in Athens, the social welfare organization, uh, gets food that is close to the end date from the industry, which is redistributed to the to institutions that, uh, that operate for people in need. Uh, so this is also one way where we can avoid the waste that would be created. And uh, a last example that is also highly important, I believe, and operates always, has been operating in close cooperation with municipalities, is the organic farmers markets, where you know I have also a first-hand experience. They operate since 1994, being since then a zero-waste uh, market institution. So the main idea is that, and here where is where a difference comes, for example, from the public markets, because the circular economy mentality is incorporated in organic agriculture from A to Z. There is no waste, so that's the basic idea. Eh? So uh, the farmers, anything that is, uh, let's say, food loss at the farm level goes to composting. When the farmers come to the market, anything that is not suitable for consumption at the end of the market is collected back and goes for composting again back to the farms. So there is no waste and no cost for the municipality, even at the collection level of the waste. So it's economic for everyone and it's a zero waste, zero cost. And at the same time, food is given at the beginning of the market for the kindergarten stations, around 50 tons of organic food per year for 27 municipalities in Athens, in metropolitan Athens, Latiki, and uh, an equal amount at the end of the market to institutions for vulnerable groups. So the main thing with these three examples, and especially the two examples, the food waste uh, collection at the end of the markets from the municipality of Athens and the Vula Vulyagmeni Vari and the organic farmers markets is that we have a model where um, where food zero food waste is part of the production process is adding economic value it's, it's not lost economic value that is somehow channeled to people in need, uh, but w which is, of course is okay and it's necessary. But it, it, it's an additional step of adding value to the waste and creating social value, economic value, and environmental value. And uh, my opinion from the policy side, from the policy perspective, is that this is necessary to consider and adopt for the future in order to have a smooth transition that can be acceptable and that can give the motivation to all interested parties. Uh, that much for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, too. Uh, it was uh, nice to hear also the uh, more institutional policy perspective. We heard about the individuals, we heard about the issues, we heard about the uh, possibilities for action. And it was nice to see, to hear the others, the more systemic aspect as well. So um, I want to remind again to everybody, everybody to write, uh, include questions in the chat. We're going to start with the first question that we have, um, which is from V. Burani and Alexander Theodoridis. What would it take to scale up your operation to handle the food waste that is still out there? Is it a matter of doing more of what you're doing now, or would it require doing something different? Um, maybe V. Buhan can start first, and then uh, Mr. Alexander Theodoridis. Um. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because I've missed you for about a second, I think. Um, um, regarding the question here about scaling up, um, from my point of view, um, I still... Mm. Mm. We have some technical problems. Maybe we 
can give the floor to uh, Alexander Sodoridis and then uh, when uh, Bivuani can talk again, we can hear her, we can continue with her. Sure. Uh, well, the, the answer in everything related to food waste is, um, is the reverse pyramid. Um, that was exactly what I was thinking about uh, when I was uh, listening to George about uh, compost as well. I mean, before we get to compost, where it, in my opinion, it, it is, it is not only my opinion, according to the reverse pyramid, it's, it's, it's a worse option than to give it to, uh, to uh, animal uh, feed, for example, or even before that to people, and even before that, what is the most important aspect is, is uh, awareness and prevention. So what we should do uh, is, first of all, not, 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 not first of all, not, not think about scaling uh, about what our actions, what, what we should do in order to save even more food. First um, mindset should be how can we prevent um, uh, food waste, the creation of food waste. So it all starts with prevention. That's the first part of my, of my reply. The second part in dealing of what is still out there is, uh, was the third pillar of, of uh, what I was mentioning about our actions where after all, all our actions uh, that we have seen and have done, we, uh, we still see so much food um, being, being wasted. Uh, our response to that is that, you know, we, we need to find um, more creative uh, ways uh, in order to upscale um, the food that otherwise would have been wasted, uh, create uh, jams, create juices, uh, create uh, wonderful meals uh, that you can uh, have through a social enterprise, train so, uh, vulnerable groups, and sell and create a product for that. This is these are all things that we are trying to do. Uh, next week we're gonna start a strategic partnership with a new application, very dynamic application that's gonna be uh, starting in Greece called NoWaste.gr, where um, we will help many companies uh, have another tool to prevent the creation of food waste before Borume steps in, so to say. So. Our focus as Borume will be uh, take the reverse pyramid and always look at the first stages of, uh, of them. If, if you cannot uh, uh, reduce through prevention, if you cannot uh, give it to a good cause, if you cannot give it for animal feed, then compost it. And then if it's not possible, unfortunately, uh, uh, it will go to, to waste. Thank you. Now we can have Bihuwan again. B, can you hear us? Okay. Um, maybe I'll follow up with this question uh, and I would like to ask you that it's very good that you actually made a bridge between the, the food availability, food waste and food availability and then food need. Uh, would you say that this needs to be institutionalized in order to uh, have a really circular economy approach. Are you asking me? <laughs> yes, this is for well, you. Well, look, uh, for many years, um, Borume, we at Borume, for many years, we've been always very, very keen in, in collaborating with all sorts of institutions uh, on, on a municipal level, on a state level, on a ministerial level. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our... Um, uh, our experience was that, uh, contrary to other countries, uh, unfortunately, Greek, Greek institutions have been very, very slow uh, to think about these issues. Unfortunately, we, a good excuse is, of course, that we had other things more, more important in the past 10 years because of the economic crisis. But um, it's, it's, of course, you need uh, institutions to, to be on your side. That's why when we created the, the alliance, our first uh, concern was and that's what we did initially was to speak to the Ministry of um, Agricultural Production and the Ministry of Environment. That's why we are so happy that we have the auspices of the Ministry of Environment because you, we have a very, very small organization. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to have substantial change, there is no other way than having public institutions on your side. Uh, mm -hmm. The reaction of municipalities to, in the economic crisis where the central government stepped back because it was uh, bankrupt. We, we didn't say it officially, but it was bankrupt. And it stepped back from all the social um, welfare uh, programs that it had. When it stepped back, the municipalities stepped in 
and 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 reached out to their uh, to their um, to their constituencies and helped and created numerous programs, uh, social programs to help at a municipal level. This was not existing ten years ago uh, to a great extent. Um, so okay. of, of course you need that, and this is what mm -hmm. we also try to bring through the incorporation of uh, the uh, European Law 851 into Greek law. Thank you. Maybe just a quick word, because we don't have very much time, just a quick word from Bivouani. Let's try to get your uh, input. Okay. Let's try to be short, because we do have a couple more questions that would be nice to address um, in the next maximum five minutes. All right. Uh, I'm going to be very short regarding the question about um, the first one that Alexandros as well just answered. Um, okay, scaling up, it's really important once all in the private and public sector have the same common goal and they totally, all of them, understand what food waste is. Uh, so if for all of us as consumers, we decide one day to cut down food waste, this is more achievable. Um, so scaling up in, in, in regards to the hospitality industry and the restaurants, uh, obviously we're talking about the prevention of the food, we're talking about awareness, awareness and education, but we need to change the mindset on people that they don't have this experience and this education and this background of what all of us here understand regarding food waste. So this is hard, it's really hard for them. And regarding the question about the media and how we co we communicate, um, if you want to communicate something to the media, the media needs data. And this is where transparency comes uh, very useful too, because we would like to uh, promote uh, activities that they're very transparent. So people, uh, they're sticking to transparency. It's something that we've seen and relating to the media, we have to communicate something that is very transparent and crystal clear so people can be um, aware regarding food waste. Uh, yes. I think that's that, actually. Thank you. Let me get to the next question. Uh, it says that there's a lot of discussion about localized food markets, but at the same time, uh, what happens with the trend of the globalization in terms of food? Uh, and um, what about food deserts? There are some places that do not have uh, fresh uh, vegetables and healthy food. How are these going to be resolved, given the local and global connection? Maybe uh, we can have Mr. Keranis and anybody else, but very short, please, so we can have uh, one last uh, more questions. Mr. Keranis? Yeah, <laughs> this is quite a question. <laughs> Uh, sorry, because first I need to digest it a bit since we're talking about food. Uh, maybe, maybe somebody has a ready answer then? Or you're ready? <laughs> Are you ready? I know, okay, I'm ready up, up to an extent. For deserts. <laughs> up to an extent. Yeah. Uh, Okay, obviously, first of all, we're not going to avoid globalization, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but we can make the best of it. Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, it's this thing, think global, act local, that we could adopt, that they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, uh, globalization can, if, you know, it's like a hammer, you can build a house and you can destroy a house. And the same goes with the local aspect. I mean, if we become too protective, eventually we will end up, you know, having only the little products that my small periphery produces and so on. So we need to find the golden mean. Uh, I really don't know if if there is an answer on, on what is the future per se. I mean, the future per se is that we're going to get global. Definitely we're getting global. The main thing would be whether the what is called developed world would be willing to start considering adopting the negative externalities of reducing food waste and changing our production model uh, for the benefit of what we call the underdeveloped or the developing world. Mm -hmm. And this is a big thing because, uh, you know, you look at the data as we said, you know, Europe needs another Europe to consume what it consumes. So are we Europeans willing to step back a bit 
from what we're used to, to become more sustainable, not in words, not in funding, not in EU programs, but in reality. Uh, and it all ends up, I guess, to what Alexander says, which has to do with education and the creation of, uh, of pretty clear intentions. Uh, that's how much I can say, I believe, about the, the global, local and food waste thing, if it helps. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to get to the next question and ask Mr. Majeras to answer this, and then maybe you can comment on something or whatever else. Uh, the next question refers, and I guess we're going to close with that. Um, what are some cross-cutting issues in terms of food waste? And what can be a driving force for more synergies across the different stages of the food chain, especially not that they are formed on a voluntary basis? And there's a follow-up to this. Um, Question, can this model for the better alignment of production consumption without the negative externalities be implemented in general or more specialized approaches are more appropriate? So given that they are voluntary, uh, what are the approaches to actually get the needed synergies uh, in order to avoid food waste? Yeah, I, I have the same reaction that George did uh, from where to tackle it. Uh, and uh, as you understand from all of us in the panel, I think that there is no uh, right or wrong answer. Uh, it all depends on what we're going to decide we're going to be doing next. So let me try to answer quickly on a few of those. So the first thing about the voluntary basis, uh, the rest of you, because you asked about also to be about this institutional approach, we are hoping at least uh, I want to stress this, that you're going to see uh, the, the laws coming into effect, and Alexander actually already mentioned this. So very soon, hopefully, the European Union at least is going to start making policies, and it's going to be uh, changing taxation and also subsidies exactly based on this. And this is why we also need to have a holistic approach to not forget the, the, the whole of the value chain. Uh, the second thing would be uh, we need to find ways that we understand that this is about people. Uh, let me talk to you about the project we're trying to jump start right now. So we have a lot of unemployment and in Greece we still have a high level of unemployment on young people. Uh, at the same time we have Greek islands that are based on the tourism in the last 20 years they have forgotten about the, the local projects. So now one of the suggestions and it's the complete example of circular economy that we go to those restaurants and hotels as we is trying to for years, teach them in the kitchen how not to throw away organic waste, work with the local government uh, in order for this to become compost. Compost is the number one thing I said in order to produce organically and actually showcase the amazing uh, local uh, products and then actually use them to attract tourism again. And what have we achieved? Creating more jobs on an island, for example. Uh, that's not dependent just on uh, renting motorbikes. Um, so uh, this, I think, is the number one location where you can try things like this. We have all these islands. We have all this unique biodiversity. We have realized that by respecting biodiversity, we can make a, a financial difference. Um, so I do think um, that we should work on, 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 on cross-cutting and cross-sectoral uh, projects like this one. Okay, I think I. Uh, uh, all right, I, can I give you the word just for half a half a minute? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, about about the question about synergies and on a voluntary basis, it has been shown uh, in every country that has been implemented. What we, we create, we started now this alliance, this 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 national agreement to to reduce food waste, which is a forum to create synergies on a voluntary basis, is by far the most effective uh, tool to reduce substantially food waste in a country where laws have been created in order to force um, uh, this, they have been so um, uh, successful, like, like in France. So the model in Italy is, uh, is, is much, much, much better. It gives more incentive to that. All of this we are trying to, to channel through the creation of the law that is coming. And I'm happy to, to tell you that uh, it, it looks very, very well. Um, that we will have on an institutional level um, many, many um, provisions that will help, but also force uh, the reduction of food waste, being uh, counting it, uh, measuring it, uh, donating it, etc., etc. 
Okay, I, I think I have to cut the meeting. The meeting. I just want to just. Uh, I think it's a good idea. The, the well, example that Mr. Maheras uh, indicated about the island and how we can use the food waste in order to uh, increase the economy and uh, have social benefits as well is a good example that we can close with that. I think this is a, an opportunity. Food waste is an opportunity if we really look at it as that and not as waste, but as food that is. Can't be wasted if we don't do something with it. So thank you all very much. Thank you for the very interesting insights, and I hope that um, everybody enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. And it was uh, brand new in Greece. Uh, nobody had uh, little second-hand clothing uh, that you could buy for Kino. And uh, it's something that the, the, the people really like coming uh, in the shop and uh, uh, to wanting to know the price that you had to wait it. So it's fun <laughs> and for the customers. Because most of the vintage shops are smaller and have uh, smaller quantities uh, than what we do. And we try to have everything in the best quality we can. And uh, find really nice and special clothing uh, for all the people. Uh, for example, uh, the last uh, three years I'm working on uh, my own uh, fashion brand, uh, which is called Art and Industry. And um, I take old clothes uh, that uh, they're not anymore in a good condition uh, to stay like this. And uh, with um, new ideas and uh, inspiration, uh, I make something new out of it. Uh, or we cut or we add up uh, things um, on clothes and uh, it becomes a new trend, a new fashion, uh, that you can wear it. It's uh, also more modern. And um, yeah, basically it's all upcycling and uh, you can find it in our stores. Yes, uh, mostly from Paris. Um, it's uh, where the Kilo Shop uh, franchise is and the big company, but uh, the owner, uh, he um, he has a wholesale from all around the world. Uh, he has uh, specialists uh, for this work where they are trying to find the best business, uh, goods uh, for the shops. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, the younger generation begins to understand that it's uh, something very crucial uh, in our uh, in our lives 
uh, to begin um, choosing uh, uh, and support uh, eco-friendly uh, stuff and uh, clothes, uh, everything uh, that is uh, more green and uh, something that um, you want to to protect the planet and uh, you want to do something and uh, it, it makes it all more responsible and uh, um, I, I, I see and uh, I, uh, every day in our stores that uh, new uh, people is coming and the uh, younger generation and they really like it too because they support the ecosystem but they also uh, make a more um, individual um, statement style because when you buy from fast fashion you basically buy uh, things that everybody wears but when you choose clothes from a vintage store uh, you make your own identity and uh, that's something I see that a younger people like to experiment with their styles and they also like to uh, make an effort for the planet and uh, give and help. We have also our original Japanese kimonos from Japan. Uh, we have California clothing. Uh, um, we have lots and lots uh, of clothing, yeah. Uh, basically, if you come by and you'll see the collective, you'll understand that we have basically very uh, nice traditional and uh, clothes that that are you know collectible and have a value. Um, like for example, another one is that we have two rolls and they are original Austrian uh, clothing uh, for men and women, and the quality is so nice and. Uh, you understand the value of it just touching the, the fabric. Hello, uh, I'm Stella Postalaki. I'm the coordinator of the Environmental Studies Program and chair of the Academic Advisory Board of the Center of Excellence for Sustainability at the American College of Greece. And I will be the moderator of this session. Uh, we have uh, just watched the video, which is on fashion. It was on uh, second-hand clothing. Uh, this is because this panel session is focusing on sustainable fashion. Fashion has been widely unsustainable in the past in matters of materials, the line of production, human resources in many occasions. It is therefore very hopeful to see initiatives that provide a new paradigm in the fashion industry, which is based on sustainability and respect for humans and the environment. With very much interest, we will follow the speeches of our guests. Uh, we will start with Dr. Fiori Zafiropoulou, who is the country coordinator for Fashion Revolution Greece. She is also the founder of SOFA and she is a research fellow uh, in the Athens University of Economics and Business. Uh, Dr. Zafiropoulou has worked uh, and she is working uh, uh, on focusing, sorry, on how to eradicate human trafficking in the fashion supply chains and how to empower women victims of slavery and women in risk, in risk of exploitation. She is also addressing climate change and the regeneration of the environment through changing paradigms in fashion production, sources, sourcing and consumption. She will talk to us about following uh, a systemic change in the way we produce, source and consume fun fun uh, fashion. Sorry. We will first watch a short video and then Dr. Zafiropoulou will join us.
滑滑的。谁制造我的衣服？Hello, thank you very much for having me uh, in your symposium and congratulations on this uh, amazing uh, symposium addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The video we, saw, uh, we just saw um, is a fashion revolution film that has won the best uh, Green Film Awards uh, from uh, Milano Fashion Film Festival uh, and uh, Athens Fashion Film Festival in 2019. Um, so the um, fashion, uh, unfortunately, uh, is the cause of um, of climate change and is polluting the environment. Being the first reason when it comes to plastic in the oceans, thirty five percent of uh, microplastics uh, in the uh, particles in the oceans are caused by fashion. If you imagine that percent of our clothes um, are made of polyester. Uh, so they come from oil. Um, this is why uh, we cause all this um, pollution to our uh, water. Uh, but uh, fashion is also the second biggest polluter to the environment because of other reasons as well. 10% of, um, of uh, gas emissions, CO2 emissions are caused by fashion. 20% of uh, water wasted comes from fashion. Uh, if you think of the plastics that are chemicals that are being uh, produced yearly, 25% of all chemicals are used in the fashion and textile industry. One uh, of uh, the reasons why this is happening is also caused by consumption, our consumption patterns. If you imagine that the last 14 years we have increased by 60%, Uh, the volume of clothes that we consume and we keep them half the time we used to keep them. 40% of what we buy, we never use. Every second, um, a truck filled with textiles uh, and uh, clothing goes to landfill. So that's a huge waste. We create mountains of waste down in Africa, in uh, Romania. But this is not the only problem that fashion causes. Fashion is also the second um, reason for human trafficking uh, in the world. And we have the biggest number of slaves that humanity has ever had. 25 million people work as modern slaves. 75 million people work directly in the fashion industry. 80% of them are women. About one out of uh, three are victims of uh, physical and verbal abuse. They work with very little pay under very unsafe conditions. Um, and of course, uh, when we say uh, very little pay, we mean that it has nothing to do with living wages. Um, due to, um, based on recent uh, research, about two billion people uh, work Um, in under conditions of exploitation, in informal uh, labor conditions. So you understand that there is a big, um, a tremendous need for a revolutionary change in the way we produce, we source, and we consume fashion. Uh, and this is something that concerns us all. I believe in the power of the individual. I believe that each, if each one of us makes the connection among their everyday life choices and the human trafficking that hides beneath or the pollution to the environment, the climate change that hides beneath, then we will understand and instantly change our uh, pattern and behavior. What Fashion Revolution does is bringing together uh, the different actors of the supply chain in the fashion industry. So we bring together into Uh, one discussion forum from uh, the farmer to the final consumer. 
Uh, you've also heard that um, I founded uh, Social Fashion Factory, SOFA. What SOFA does, SOFA is an ethical producer. So brands, as you, uh, as you well know, uh, do not produce for themselves. They outsource their production. But where is this production taking place? Unfortunately, this production is globally taking place under conditions of informal labor and human trafficking. I've been visiting production stations and units here in Greece, um, and I've seen a lot, of, um, a, lot, a lot of slavery happening. Uh, we've written about that. We've written about stories of, uh, of children, 16, 17 years old, uh, being locked up uh, in uh, garment factories in Athens. Um, We've learned that brands pay as little as one euro to produce their clothes. And from that one euro, imagine who can be paid from that one euro. That is why uh, we've heard that salaries and wages in Greece of women, uh, not refugees, not migrants, Greek women, are uh, down to four euros per day. Who can live? and survive with uh, that uh, few of, uh, of money. So what SOFA does, uh, in SOFA we produce garments, clothes, accessories, um, and we pay uh, our uh, tailors and everybody involved. We use, uh, we try to regenerate the environment by using circular fashion uh, production processes, by using sustainable textiles, vegan, new innovative uh, leathers that come from mushrooms, from, um, uh, from uh, pineapple um, and different sources. Uh, we are zero waste. Uh, so we try uh, and we have almost uh, minimum uh, waste. Uh, another role, uh, a very important role and the primary role of SOFA is that uh, we offer uh, empowerment to women, victims of human trafficking and women in risk of exploitation and exclusion. How do we do that? We train those women in tailoring and in fashion design, and we offer them employment. Um, so this is, uh, this is the, the, the theory of change of SOFA, and the way we do it uh, is by, um, uh, by creating own income and generating income from sales. So we've never received any funding or grants. We train and empower our beneficiaries we meet our environmental and social goals through the money we raise from sales. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zafiropoulou. Uh, we will come back to you uh, in the question and answer session. Very interesting what you have presented to us, a very interesting initiative and very hopeful. Uh, I would like us to go to our next uh, presenter, who is uh, Mrs. Tiliani Parasa. Uh, she's the founding president of the Fashion Re Revolution uh, Luxembourg. She is uh, a sustainable fashion and communications consultant. She uh, is working for more than a decade on how fashion is, uh, can be interrelated to pressing social issues, as, and she has been designing collections for a sustainable Athenian brand. Uh, she is actively engaged in research on how immigration and fashion are interconnected and how can benefit from, uh, from each other. She has been animating upcycling workshops, organizing fashion events, and preaching a sustainable and fashionable, fashionable lifestyle in Luxembourg and uh, beyond the borders of this country. Today, she's going to, uh, to present to us how we can boost the sustainable Greek fashion. Miss, uh, Mrs. Parasha, thank you very much. Thank you, dear Stella. We are both Stellas here. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Thank you, first of all. Thank you, Rania, and thank, uh, to the, thanks to the team uh, for inviting me. Let me share my screen to start explaining how we can boost the, uh, the sustainability part in uh, Greek fashion. Voila. Uh, do you see it? Is it okay? Yes. 
Okay, perfect. So let me start. So this is me. Uh, you've heard who I am, but what I wanted to uh, focus on is that hello, I am still Yanni, <laughs> and I wear secondhand and old clothes in all these occasions. And also today, um, I am wearing secondhand clothes. I'm wearing older clothes that uh, friends are giving me, that I'm swapping in uh, like public swap events, uh, that I'm finding. Sometimes even, you know, uh, like uh, maybe outside of a house, I don't know, they do it a lot in Brussels, they do it a lot in Berlin. I don't think they do it so much in Greece. People, they don't want like maybe an item anymore. It can be clothes, it can be anything, and they just leave it outside or they leave it, you know, inside their like block of flat and then someone else can take it. So this jumper, that's how I found it in my sister's place in Berlin. This one, uh, it's 10 years old. I'm wearing it for 10 years. I bought it before I lived Greece for Luxembourg. And this is a way to boost uh, the sustainability element in Greek fashion. Uh, making a second hand and old clothes, uh, swapped, pre-loved, and all these, they all have, I mean, they have many names, but it's all the same. It's basically clothes that exist before us and they are not bought new, uh, to make them cool. So this is a first advice. Here uh, is uh, a bit uh, when I started. So I started 2014 to ask these clothes, attend, uh, these questions attentively. Uh, Fiori, hi Fiori, you're watching now. Uh, Fiori explained you more about fashion evolution before, so I will not go in depth, uh, no need. Uh, these are the two questions we are asking at Fashion Evolution. Who made my clothes? Transparency. Who is behind? Who is the face behind? And what's in my clothes when it comes to ingredients? What are the ingredients? So I started asking these questions in 2014, but I was already doing research in 2010. Uh, I was doing a master's at Pandion at that time. And I was really curious to see how fashion is interconnected to social issues and if it is. And I mean, of course, I found that it's very connected uh, to not only to ecology, because now we are targeting more ecology, but also to, of course, social issues, uh, as Fiori mentioned, uh, exploitation, child labor, and then even politics and economics and many, many other um, domains. And this also connected, of course, to the SDGs. I will go through all this very fast because I think I don't have enough time uh, but let me show you to how many SDGs fashion, uh, the fashion industry is connected. So gender equality, the first and maybe one of the most important through the women workers, because more than 80% of the women who are uh, making our clothes, mostly in developing countries, are of course women. And then of course, responsible consumption and production. Fashion is connected to that. Uh, kind of is connected today, not a lot, but it wants to, I mean, it wants to be responsible. And it and there's a lot of effort in the industry. This and work and economic growth, of course, connected, because this, uh, this industry is a huge industry. It's like a multi-billion uh, industry. Uh, life uh, below water, as Fiori mentioned again, microplastics, unfortunately, the main source of microplastics in the oceans is clothes, unfortunately. Maybe you didn't know that. And then life on land as well. Uh, land feels full of clothing, full of clothing that people don't even wear more than twice. They wear once for a party and then they throw away. Let's go now to something else. Why fashion in Greece? Uh, because I thought when I saw this title of the panel, what will my foreign friends say, they will think, what, like fashion in Greece? I don't think, I don't think I know anything about it. I mean, Greece is maybe known about food more, no? Or like Greek holidays and islands, but not so much about fashion. So just a quick overview. Back in the 80s, actually Greece was pretty established in a, mostly in the European industry. There were a lot of textile factories spread uh, in northern Greece ma mainly. There were uh, these packages, EU, the Lors packages, uh, subsidizing uh, these activities. So a lot of small factories uh, called Viotechnies mostly. 
uh, that had good clients though, that had good clients. So large fashion companies were going to these biotechnias, uh, smaller or bigger, to produce their clothes. And they had an amazing quality. I have done a lot of research. I spoke to many of these people that now probably are retired and have closed their businesses. And they were telling me how uh, reputable brands, like from Italy even, uh, kind of Versace, you know, level, were doing uh, work with uh, Greek factories and they were cre creating samples, for instance, or even full collections, a lot of German brands as well. But that was back in the 80s, right? What happened in the 2000, uh, around 2000? Of course, the fast fashion phenomenon started emerging. Global garment production has shifted to Asia. Inflation affected the price of raw materials, so they became more expensive. The wages adjusted ac across uh, the EU. That means uh, Greece became more expensive because before it was, of course, much cheaper to produ produce fashion in Greece. And the Greek entrepreneurs in fashion, what did they do? They closed down their businesses or they started production in Bulgaria or Firom uh, because it was cheaper. And it's still the case. Well, let's see. It's still the case. So a lot of production, even the made in Greece that you see, let me add this. I mean, it's a bit sad, but important to say. Uh, you can have uh, an item tagged made in Greece and uh, not, uh, uh, and not uh, I mean, uh, it's not, it can be just uh, the tag. It can be produced in Bulgaria or wherever else for that sake, uh, but it can come and then the tag is added later because by law, the finishings, they are um, like the finishing the garment can be done in the final country and then the final country uh, is the one that counts when it comes to how to name the, the like this item that where it's coming from so let's see at the numbers greek consumers we are really spending a lot <laughs> we are spending more than richer countries in the european union we are spending more than germany more than france more than the uk and spain uh, we are at 5.8% of our income. Uh, we are spending it in fashion and in shoes. And they are only spending 4 and 5%. Uh, now, in 2019, uh, textile and fashion industry together, so fashion industry and textile industry, uh, I translate um, the close to Fandur year, right? So I don't know how that was. I mean, it is textile industry. So it went up 30%, more than 30%, which is the highest number, the exports, I mean, they went up 30%, and which is the highest numbers, number of the past 12 years, which shows an amazing potential, right? An amazing potential. And 70% of these exports, they still originate from a district of central Macedonia. It's still Northern Greece that produces more fashion right now, but why not expand? It can go everywhere. It can go, uh, Athens can become a bigger producer as well, and like Attiki region and many other regions. Uh, so one of uh, the tips as well, let's embrace fashion made in Greece. Uh, sustainability is uh, too many things, you know, many different things. It's not only organic cotton or recycled or secondhand. I mean, my preference might be secondhand, but made in Greece is also uh, a quite an okay choice. I mean, we heard that, of course, <laughs> made in Greece is not actually always made in Greece, but you are still supporting local brands, which is a good way to boost uh, the uh, local industry. You, you see some of the examples here. Uh, all these are Greek Hello. brands that I like. Yeah. We should wrap up this uh, this speech. Great, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Well. I'm sorry to do that. <laughs> okay, so do I have like one more minute or? Yes, one more okay. minute. Yes. Great. Thank thanks, you. Thanks. I knew I would run. Oh my god, I talk too much. So uh, some other tips that I will just go through very quickly because these were the main ones. We need to educate ourselves on materials. Then we need to be open-minded. Fiori also mentioned uh, new materials, innovative materials that come that are made in the lab, made from biofabrication. 
we need to stop overconsumption and impulsive shopping because we see that it doesn't bring us too much joy. It lasts only one day and it lasts only half a day even. These are the numbers, how much it lasts, the pleasure that we get from impulsive shopping. And then quality versus quantity, of course, we need to go for quality. We need to repair to make do and mend and to use the seamstresses and the tailors in our neighborhoods in Greece. We need to ask, of course, brands to sew the face behind our clothes. And we need more social business models like Fiori, a Fiori's business model like Sofa. And then a few more tips, but this is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all in, in the same spirit made in Greece. Uh, prefer pre-loved and vintage, go to clothes, swaps, repair, reuse, upcycle, etc. And and I think that's it. You, you get the idea. This is me. This is my team in uh, Luxembourg. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always find me. Drop me a mail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you for what you have presented. Uh, we will come back to you again with uh, questions. I think uh, the audience have already started sending questions, so we will have an interesting discussion at the end. Uh, we will move to our next speakers, Mrs. Valicia Gozzi and Ms. Stella Panagopoulou, a lot of Stellas uh, today, <laughs> uh, who are representing an ethical designer brand based in Athens, Greece. The brand was founded by these two ladies in 2017 through a synthesis of minimalism and de-reconstructivism that is exposing the principle of environmental consciousness, their brand aims to sound out the cultural fluidity and an increasingly nomadic generation of an increasingly nomadic generation. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us on your online symposium and congratulations for this initiative of yours. So, so we're two plus one equals two. We started the brand in uh, 2017 because uh, we wanted to create long lasting garments. And um, we didn't find something that uh, uh, covers our design. Uh, uh, our aesthetics. Our because, aesthetics. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we used to believe that in order to be sustainable, this means that you should be a little bit boring. Many people think of that. And we wanted to give the design element to this aspect of fashion. So we, our design concept is based on minimalism and nomadism. Every collection is based on a different city around the globe. And we draw inspiration from every aspect of the city, it's architecture, it's music scene, it's uh, art scene. And uh, we incorporate all those elements in our uh, collections. Uh, we also use only uh, natural materials and uh, friends and bound scenes uh, that make the garment uh, last through time. Yes, our goal is to create timeless pieces, but we try to incorporate more design or more um, deeply thought inventive details. And for example, this uh, procedure of ours contributes to the, to the sustainability of our garments because when we, when we cut our, our clothes, on the fabric and we realized that uh, uh, chunks of pieces are left over. Uh, we immediately think of extra details that we can add to the garment so as to not throw much of the fabric away. And to incorporate it into the design. So uh, a lot of gar our garments have small uh, design details that's uh, to avoid the fabric waste. And we also urge our customers to bring us back their overworn two plus one items and uh, we will give new life to them and uh, we'll reshape them into a new garment. Uh, for example, they can give us a skirt and we can, we can make it into a hoodie, let's say. <laughs> yes, but we keep the... Um 
the the main elements of every of every garment. If it's something that is really um, I don't know, special about this garment, we of course uh, keep it to the next one. Um, moreover, we try to challenge ourselves with new materials. We are also on the search of finding new materials. For example, we stumbled upon um, a material that's called banana silk, and it is made out of the, um, how is it called? It's not the stems. Yeah, from the stems of the, um, of the banana. Yeah, and um, silk. yes, and we experimented with this uh, fabric a lot. Um, we are so, we are in a constant search of new materials and mm. uh, regenerated and um, recycled, and um, we always search for uh, new ways to work uh, with our garments. Yes, and. Uh, Moreover, what we firmly believe is uh, that consumers should be a little bit more thoughtful. Um, we believe that uh, they should think twice before every their purchase, every purchase they make. They should think wisely, why do I need this garment? Will I wear it more than once or twice? Um, and more importantly, um, what kind of philosophies do they support with each purchase they make? I think that the key is to, to try to, to calm down, to tone down their insatiable appetite for buying all the time and turn to invest to more timeless pieces, more uh, quality constructed, and that they will be able to have them for the rest of their lives. That's what we try to do. And our goal is not to urge the customers to shop more, but to shop less, but uh, more quality garments. That's why we don't follow trends. And um, the trend makes a garment uh, disposable in uh, six months. And we try our uh, every item in our collections to be timeless, actually. Uh, we can uh, also make a summer outfit into a winter one if we change the fabric that's our goal and um, by using friends and bouncings we also ensure the long longevity of the garment um i think that's it from what we're um we're doing here and what we Propose to the the consumer to the consumers out there. Very interesting suggestion. Uh, thank you very much, Valicia and Stella. I think we are ready to take questions from uh, from the audience. There are a few questions. Uh, I think this uh, session has generated a lot of interest and we will have a very nice discussion. Uh, I will start with uh, a question that it is addressed to all of our speakers, so we can have a turn one by one. Uh, one question is, uh, uh, how uh, does your organization, your brand, uh, measure progress in terms of the SDGs, of the Sustainable Development Goals, since this symposium is about implementation of the SDGs? So how do you measure uh, the progress with regard to the SDGs? Is there a way you do it or, or thinking of doing it? Uh, who would like to start? Maybe... I can, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you very well. I don't know if somebody else can repeat the question. Yes, I can repeat the question. Uh, Stella, did you hear it? I think she did because she was about to re re respond. <laughs> I will reply to the, I will, sorry, I will repeat the question and Stella can uh, go ahead first. Uh, how does your brand or your um, organization uh, measure the progress towards the SDGs? Are there any indicators? Uh, is there something that uh, you do in order to measure progress towards uh, achieving the SDGs within your brand? 
I, so I wanted to say, and not exactly how we are doing it, but at Fashion Evolution, so it goes both ways. I mean, I mean it's both for Fiori and for me. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to mention how how hard it is in general to measure impact. Uh, it's one of the hardest things, and and there there are there are discussions. Uh, discussions of if we are doing it right and how can we improve measuring impact is not an easy thing and measuring uh, impact when it comes to SDGs I think it's even harder because not all SDGs of course apply to fashion I mean I told you that there are four main that apply uh, we have the fashion transparency index in fashion evolution and that is, and that is what we are trying to do so I don't think we uh, try to basically integrate SDG so much. We mostly try to hold brands accountable and to uh, check what they are doing and if they are transparent enough when it comes to fashion production. Uh, and that, I would say, is connected in a way to the SDGs, right? Because, of course, uh, gender equality is very much connected to uh, transparency because if we know who is making the clothes, how many women, how many men, uh, hopefully not children, etc., uh, this is already uh, an indicator. But I mean, directly, we don't really track something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I heard uh, Stella, um, and I want to say with this opportunity uh, that uh, Stella is uh, one of the the first uh, people to join uh, Sofa Vision and. And in the first steps, uh, she was part of the founding team, um, and she was helping uh, helping me realize this um, this dream. Um, so I'm very happy that we're on the same panel. Regarding yes, it's amazing. <laughs> regarding, first time on the same panel. That's true. Um, regarding measuring the impact in Sofa, we have uh, developed a very elaborating elaborated uh, social metrics um, uh, system where we measure um, the impact based on our vision and our goals and of course um, SDGs uh, and specifically the SDGs uh, that um, we uh, we are uh, we're targeted to achieve that are uh, that have to do with gender uh, equality um, with production uh, with poverty um, so, uh, with uh, climate change and the planet. Uh, so th these are things that, of course, we measure against. Good, thank you. The two plus one equals uh, two. Would you like uh, Valicia and Stella to make a comment on, on this? Um, we definitely can't um, uh, think about... Uh, think again. Um, what we try to do as a brand, we don't know how to measure. We're not doing this. We just pay attention to what we do and to the people that we work with. You know, we we turn to the back to the craft based system and we try to work with the people here in Greece, and um, that's the, the main way that we work. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't uh, take uh, uh, we don't do something about these measures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if I could add something after hearing all of you, I would say that uh, by engaging uh, a fair, by enabling a fair environment for women and men, by uh, enabling uh, a decent payment, uh, this is a way also to achieve some of the SDGs. Also, I would like to add a question. This is my question. It does not come from the audience. It is linked to the previous one. Uh, I, it was very interesting to hear that you are using alternative fabrics. Uh, Fiori, you have mentioned that you use fabrics from uh, mushrooms, made from mushrooms, and the, the, the girls, Valicia and Stella, said that they are using uh, bananas. Uh, I understand that this makes the fabrics recyclable as well. It would be nice uh, to have recycling schemes for your garments and for your uh, for your uh, your clothing. Um, is there something you are working towards? Um, if we're working towards recycling, yes. Uh, so, 
Yes, so circularity is very important, uh, as everyone has uh, mentioned in this panel. So what we um, what we do, we tackle our waste, uh, but when it comes to recycle, the, the, the important thing is actually to recycle waste in order to produce thread mm -hmm. and then have the textile that's recycled. This is a project that we've been trying to do for years. Um, and uh, as fashion revolution, so what you need is uh, we're looking for funding, actually. So if someone yes. can support us, it would be great. Uh, we have uh, we have very, um, very high skilled scientists with uh, uh, two P post PhDs and PhDs that are uh, on this uh, exactly issues. Um, so it's not that hard uh, to uh, acquire the machinery in order to uh, to thread the textile and then bring it back um, mm -hmm. to uh, to the thread uh, uh, weaver. Uh, we have this. Um, we have the partners. We know where to send it, and then mm -hmm. uh, it's about ten percent only of recycled thread that can be mixed with new uh, thread. Let's say cotton. All right. Um, and of course, so yeah. and of course, people would have to engage into that and to return their clothes for recycling. This is another aspect. The which, most important uh, is to choose. Uh, Stella mentioned the the two uh, campaigns of Fashion Revolution: who made my clothes and what's in my clothes. So, what's in my clothes is very important. If uh, you need to select clothes that are 100% plant based and that are 100% cotton or 100% linen. Uh, or from the plant-based leathers in order for them to be recycled. If it comes to plastic and you want to use plastic, then again, you need to opt for 100% uh, plastic and recycled plastic thread, mm -hmm. which is widely used nowadays. There is a lot of innovation in that. So Good. this is very important, not to use the mixed tasta that we say in Greek, the mixed uh, textiles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Valicia and Stella and Fiori as well, uh, are you manufacturing the fabrics from bananas and from mushrooms? Is, is this done in Greece? I'm not saying if you are doing it. Is it done here or do you import uh, the, the fabric that comes from this material? We mainly import our fabrics mm -hmm. because um, we, don't, we haven't heard of it, uh, of uh, Greek manufacturers that uh, do sustainable fabrics. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that we do, uh, that we do in Greece is our uh, organic uh, wool knitted, so um, it's knitted mm -hmm. here in Greece. But uh, I collabor we have a collaboration, and uh, all the other fabrics, the sustainable ones, are from uh, are imported. But we also do uh, source uh, natural fabrics from Greece, of course. Good. So a good idea for a new manufacturer for producing. There is sustainable, um, there is recycled plastic produced in Greece from Fieratex. That's a weaver in the north of Greece, in uh, Orestiada. Um, there is no organic cotton. And to be honest, I don't use organic cotton because organic cotton, unless there is a certification for human rights, is the product of modern slavery. We have zero organic cotton in Greece. So when you hear of Greek organic cotton, it means that it's imported from Turkey and it's probably a human trafficking product, but we have Greek, Greek clean cotton um, that is clean from human trafficking. And it's also one of the best qualities worldwide. Greece produces 85% of cotton of, uh, Euro for Europe uh, and one of the best qualities and the most sustainable cotton uh, globally. Um, and then we have um, and other um, and other uh, choices, but not uh, the ones that you mentioned, the banana and all that. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, to, are hard to find, uh, actually. Yes, but in order to avoid misunderstandings, our organic cotton, we, we don't have it from here, from Greece. We bring it from the Netherlands, from a specific manufacturer that has uh, quite a lot of gods, so we think we're covered from, from this point of view. Good. 
Uh, another question to all of you, it is about secondhand clothes. Uh, how easy do you think is to convince people to use secondhand clothes in Greece? We know it's not very popular in Greece. It is becoming a little bit more popular, but yet it is not as it is in other countries of, uh, of Europe. Um, if you would like to have a word on that and we can close this session with this. Uh, Stella, I, Fiori, you like Fiori to start? Go. Ah, Fiori. Ah, I can. <laughs> yeah, but Fiori, I don't no, know. No, no, Stella, you go. You go. <laughs> I mean, I'm a big fan of second hand, but I do know that Greece, unfortunately, is not, yeah, it's not there yet, but you know why? Because Greece is, I mean, a country, I mean, of course, we are not a developing country, right? But we were a poor country not a long time ago. So anything that is secondhand or all this American help that was coming, you know, I mean, it was considered that it was for poor people. So people still make this association, you know, they want to buy something new. They don't want secondhand because they think, no, that means that I'm poor. And it's kind of, it turns them off. It, it's not like chic enough for them. But I think how to how to try to change this perspective. I think it's really uh, a lot uh, to do with influencers, with public personas, you know, with actresses, actors, uh, all these people that have power and that are very visible. I think maybe Greek TV also, because I mean, I never watch TV, but I know that people watch TV here. Uh, so I think it's very important to just make it cool in a way to make it mainstream, because for me. I find it's very cool everywhere else. Like I was in Berlin to do a master's recently. Everybody wears second hand. They don't want to wear anything else. I mean, it's just 80s and 90s fashion. They go around. And if they come in Greece, you would say, oh, he looks like a hobo. But no, I mean, they are cool in Berlin. So I think you have to make it cool, that's all. And it's just by using marketing, the same marketing techniques that you use for any other product, I think you have to use for secondhand as well. And I don't think it's very hard. You just have to want to do it. But then who would pay for this? I mean, I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe, the, not the Greek government, but I think maybe a coalition of people that want to sell, of like, you know, retailers that want to sell secondhand, second hand sorry or i mean someone needs to pay for this kind of marketing campaigns that have a social impact and it's just a matter of collaboration in general and i don't see this a lot in greece i think i mean it's starting but i think i would like to see more collaboration for these bigger scheme projects mm -hmm. someone else would like to add something Are you covered? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think it's uh, pretty much covered as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, what Stella said is very important. Uh, in the interaction that I have with um, uh, with uh, younger people, um, there is a very a big uh, demand from Greeks for second hand, and they ask me if people living in other uh, places uh, around Greece. That there are not secondhand uh, shops right now we have about four in athens uh, where they can get them so the uh, the reply is online and they can access um, many uh, stores that are second hand and just to to keep in mind that second hand will be one third of the market by 2030. Mm -hmm. very interesting uh, there were Another two questions as we've been talking very fast. Is the recycling in fast fashion stores a step towards the right direction? I think that was indirectly answered, right? That uh, enabling more recycling uh, of items would be in the right direction. It is a matter of uh, how we can achieve that. Is that right? Yes. Okay. More or less, now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say that when it comes to fast fashion brands, no, sorry, very quickly, they don't, I mean, at the time being, they don't really recycle everything they are collecting. They are, they are doing these collecting schemes and take back schemes, which is great. This is in the right direction. But for the time being, as Fiori mentioned, we don't have the technology. We can only recycle monomaterial products. And that means that basically they are like just you know putting stuff aside in in some kind of warehouse or they are sending it over to become like for clothes to become carpets etc because uh 
that's what uh, is happening usually with textile waste. They become carpets, industrial carpets and stuff like that. They don't become textiles and clothes again. So we still have way to go uh, with, in the R&D direction because I think we really need research and development and we are not uh, investing in, uh, enough in that. But uh, we, I mean, we, we have to, we, it will happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was a very interesting discussion. Uh, we are very thankful for having you in our symposium. Uh, we will move now and we will uh, close the symposium by uh, the um, speech we will have the closing remarks from the uh, from all these three days from three uh, Millennium Fellows, three students who are Millennium Fellows. Uh, so, uh, from me, uh, goodbye. Thank you very much for being present here. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear us. Um, we can hear each other, right? Barbara and Joe? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of the uh, main contributors, I would like to say, especially uh, uh, Ms. Karidis and Ms. Asaria Pake, sorry if I spelled wrongly, for their effort, for their commitment, for their uh, limitless support. And uh, I would like to thank also uh, Professor Krisa uh, Zahu, she uh, contributed a lot, uh, put a lot for this uh, success. Also for other moderators, for uh, Dr. Stella uh, Apostolaki also. Yes, uh, it was a long term uh, kind of marathon. We started in, I think in March, and but practically it was very uh, intense brainstorm. And, but practically we started in August to shape after so many ideas, suggestions uh, from Barbara, from Joe, from other uh, fellows uh, in our team, ACG teams, and uh, with perfect teamwork, I would like to say. Uh, now, without losing so much time, uh, I would like to give the floor for first day summary. Who would like to start? Okay, uh, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining in on our three day symposium. Uh, my name is Jadir Hassan uh, Said, and I would like to be the first to take the liberty to thank, of course, uh, once again, the Office of Public Affairs, uh, Dr. Frisa Zaku, Ms. Rania Suriyotaki, uh, and Ms. VP uh, Claudia Caribis for everything that they, they have helped, out, uh, helped us with uh, throughout this whole process. Uh, that we are extremely proud of, uh, and I would first uh, I I would like to be the one to thank uh, everyone, all the panelists and moderators today uh, in both of our panel discussions. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, our moderator of uh, the first panel discussion today of sustainable consumption and solution for food waste in Athens, Dr. Krishna Maruli. Um, I would like to go on to thank the panelists, first of all, uh, Ms. V. Burani for offering a very, very eye-opening question on whether COVID-19 will be the final straw that will completely destroy uh, this sustainable effort for the, in the industry or will be the catalyst for a complete change and shift yes. in perspective on how we view food consumption uh, and waste. Um, and her stressing of the importance in transparency and effective reporting of the food waste uh, in hotels, in restaurants, and uh, all other organizations, companies, mm -hmm. and industries that use uh, and consume uh, food. Uh, I would then like to go on uh, to thank Mr. Alexander Silveridis with his extremely inspiring uh, results of the Borume organization. Uh, it's truly amazing yes. to see how an initiative can blossom and help so many lives, uh, especially here in Greece, uh, and uh, imagine what uh, other initiatives can do all around the world and how much they can help people. Um, 
and it is very very important to to have in mind that it is not only saving food but actually educating people on their responsibility and part in all this uh, effort because we're all in this together. Uh, I would like to go on to thank uh, Mr. Cosendo Mangeras, uh, the CEO of um, Organization Earth. Uh, I have personally had the honor as a student uh, in middle school to go uh, visit the center of the Earth. Uh, and it was an amazing experience, and it really shows uh, how he wants, how he and the whole organization wants to focus on experiential learning. Um, be stressing again the fact that uh, it's a collaboration, a collaborative effort of all of us uh, to create something wonderful and change the world in this respect. Uh, and finally, uh, I would like to thank George Keranis with his very, very uh, eye-opening and insightful statistics on uh, food consumption here in Greece. Um, and that it is very, very important to have a smooth transition to a zero waste uh, food uh, society without creating problems in the society itself uh, from a, a leap to the overconsumption that we're having today uh, to a more sustainable and um, sustainable effort in the food uh, creation and consumption. Um, now, transitioning, continuing to uh, this fashion revolution with the introduction from uh, Danai Danake's video of her art and industry company that uh, the girls, some of the girls and partners in the Lenny uh helped create. Um, I want to go on and thank uh, the moderator, Dr. Stella Posalaki, of this panel discussion, diversifying sustainable Greek fashion in context of a proactive act. Uh, and then I would like to continue to go thank uh, Ms. Fiori Zafiropoulou, uh, who focused on how the fashion industry and fast fashion today has been a huge, huge culprit in the climate change crisis that we are facing, uh, from plastic uh, in the ocean to gas emissions to the overconsumption that leads to the discrimination and oppression of people in marginal of marginalized communities and uh, developed countries and countries. Um, she, she, she stresses, she emphasizes the fact that everybody has a power to change this. Uh, but the first step is all of us to understand our case, how we are a part of this fast fashion overconsumption uh, in the fashion industry. I would like to go on and thank Ms. Siliani Parasa, who offers both solutions in boosting the sustainability efforts in fashion uh, and her initiative to make old clothes cool i put it 100 <laughs> things we do reconsider uh not throwing out our clothes and reusing them recycling them um and creating something new uh of our old clothes um transparency key it's one of her main uh in it, it main focus uh and the two questions of who made clothes and what my clothes are extremely important in reconsidering our uh, part in the whole uh, issue. Um, her history uh, in great fashion and how we've gotten here is very, very insightful and informative. Uh, and uh, the subject to embrace the fashion made in Greece and local uh brands is very important uh to not only for uh the sustainable community out there but also for the greek economy if you can uh if i might add um she stresses that education is important uh and she cannot, she makes us see uh consequences of impulse shopping and overconsumption. Finally, uh, I cannot leave out uh, thanking Ms. Vasilia and uh, for, for their presentation of their ethical designer brands um, and their focus on long lasting, creating long lasting garments. Um, and their focus is very, they focus on exposing and challenging this misconception that 
sustainable fashion is boring. Uh, that people might have. Uh, and they stress that fabric should not be waste and that we should strive, fashion industry should strive to create and discover new materials uh, like plant-based materials in order to help uh, create a more sustainable and zero waste uh, fashion industry. Um, that is it for me. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining. Thank Thank you again for participating. I would also like to take uh, a minute to thank all my amazing peers and Melinda Fellows that helped make this uh, effort happen. I am super, super proud of all of our work, uh, and I really hope that it will inspire other people to take initiative and put their own uh, hat in changing the world and making it a better place. Thank you so much. And I'll leave the virtual floor to Barbara and Hassan. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear Joanna. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to mention about the summary also, second day. Uh, if you remember, it was uh, about gender inequalities, uh, bringing diversity to the workplace. It was moderated by Dr. Uh, Chris Zaho. Um, yeah, it was uh, really amazing for me because it was the main issue we are also discussing in the uh, Millennium Fellowship Program, uh, equality issue, the, 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 the uh, still bleeding wound of humanity. And what are we doing here in Greece? What is the situation in Greece? Uh, according to Professor Maria Stratigaki, she gave us very detailed uh, uh, information some um, statistics also. Uh, I impressed by her uh, pointing out to SDG 1, 3, 8, 10, and 16, how they, uh, all of them include uh, the, um, has importance for gender equality issue. I don't want to say gender equality, gender inequality. This is important to point out. Um, how can we empower the women from legislation to behavior, daily, daily life? Uh, yes, we have we have improved very improved very uh, well um, in all sp uh, sphere of life, work, uh, education. But still, we have serious gender gaps, and uh, we see this uh, segregation against women uh, due to their traditional role imposed to them. Um, and what about pandemic? What happened during the pandemic? According to uh, Professor Stratigaki. Uh, it's deepening this uh, segregation, uh, this equality issue, because remote, uh, remote work, according to her, created double burden on women, especially who have children. They are at homework, yes, good, but they are think, taking care of the children, the kids. Emotionally, if you can uh, consider uh, how when kids, when women working at home, kids come to her, ask something, how the pressure, emotional pressure on women. So. Uh, this uh, important point that uh, Professor Strakiyaki uh, uh, explained to us. Uh, the last uh, remark is important also for me, uh, making the connection, the link between global and local issue. Uh, women, 50% of the population, but the burden of work and children still on them. She, uh, her remark is very important. Then we heard up, uh, uh, the legal issue, legislation part of the uh, this problem from Ms. Harakioni mentioned about gender-based violence is so still, still wide from third world countries to developed countries. Same year, you can say that. Uh, and uh, emphasis on, it's very important also, the underreported, under-investigated, under-persecuted and under-sentenced. This, this is the main issue, main I think a striking uh, point for uh, this issue uh, explained by Ms. Hara. Uh, lockdown again uh, created big problem for legislation issue for a facility of uh, women who faced, uh, faced the, um, the violence. How they can access under the lockdown? How can do that? This technical issue also facility issue bringing up by uh, Ms. Kioni. We have to make a change about that. Uh, from Ms. Maria uh, Zoratiadu, also the most striking uh, remark about the glass ceiling, uh, how the glass ceiling affect uh, women in Greece. 
we have, as I mentioned before, Ms. Uh, Maria also mentioned Professor Sadigaki. The uh, Ms. Maria Zoratiadu uh, also now mentioned about the glass ceiling effect. Um, integration, education, giving more opportunity to women. This is the main thing. In this, we can empower the women. From Mr. Stel, Mrs. Sorry, Ms. Stella Kashtali, we heard about uh, equality in the workplace and women empowerment. Uh, the main thing I think can uh, I can um, uh, bring in forefront. The men can do, not men can. I can, can say men should do more. This is from Ms. Kashtali. Uh, without men, effect men um, support, uh, we cannot improve. The second uh, panel at this day about sustainable city and creating an open, uh, proactive, and diverse diversity in essence, which uh, moderated by Dr. Stella Apostolaki. Uh, we started with a beautiful short video, uh, Trigono. I really impressed a lot uh, by Ms. Uh, Delin, uh, Elena Dalmas. Uh, her remark on cultural, historical, uh, and commercial. Uh, dialectic and interaction is important to, to, to be able to bring all of them together, not to exclude one uh, sphere of life. Both, all of them is create the diversity of atoms in this uh, revitalized area. This is important. From Mr. Pakis Opatimitri, we see that uh, the uh, very important and example project about Athens Airport, uh, how can uh, one project can combine all the uh, uh, sustainable sustainability goals in one project. It's so important. Uh, showing the holistic approach, sustainable governance. And Sorry, Hassan, to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, just one second, because Please. we have a, a little bit of a time constraint. So sorry. Okay. Uh, conclude what you have to say. Yes, and yes, yes. I want, I want, I want special forms neon art part. Without art, city nothing. It's important. Thank you, Miss Neon, for uh, bringing uh, inside the transformation power of the art inside the city to make more, more meaningful the life from environment, geographical environment, and culture, the residents. Thank you so much, Miss Neon. And Miss Rania, we thank you uh, again a lot to bringing in our effort, ACG's effort, greening the city and supporting local communities. Uh, amazing, thank you so much. Yes, Barbara, jump in. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we're so we inspired to heard... talk for hours. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, this is, this is where my <laughs> point was going. Yeah, I feel like as a whole, we've learned so much. Yes, yes. Panels, just as my teammates explained, how important it is, not only sustainability, but also to address inequality. And personally, I will be talking about the first day of our event, uh, which relates to inequality as Hassan stated it, but in a different way. Uh, personally, through the panels that were discussed in the first day, I learned a lot about inequality and space because Professor Malutas, he discussed how the actual spatial distancing of the neighborhoods of Athens play an important role and the differences between societal groups in Athens. And furthermore, Vice Mayor of Social Solidarity in Athens, Ms. Alexia Evert, she discussed how these inequalities are faced by the government and how they create different programs in order to address them and provide solutions to minorities and to discontent groups. For example, they use the Help at Home program, which helps the elderly, which offers companionship and care to the elderly, which cannot afford it. Furthermore, Dr. Trikalinu had discussed in the first session how another facility within Athens offers aid and addresses inequality within the context of Athens and social uh, integration, where this facility called King Jason Hotel, formerly King Jason Hotel, uh, offers accommodation as well as social and um, and financial support to refugees uh, where they are housed there. And Dr. Trikalinu discussed how social integration is a very important factor in making sure that Athens is not only a sustainable city, but also an equal city. 
And despite having some difficulties in the social integration part, which were also discussed by Professor Malutas regarding spacing and how uh, a specific neighborhood displays itself, both through the buildings, both through the green spaces, and how that directly uh, shows socioeconomic uh, contrasts. Despite this, it's still important to keep in mind all these efforts that different people and different organizations, such as Dr. Trikalinu through Nostos organization, do. Finally, we concluded our panel on the first day with, with an excellent speech uh, from the founder and editor of Schedia Street Magazine, Mr. Chris Alfadiz, who discussed how art and creativity can actually help these deprived populations, such as the homeless, to sort of create an individual individuality for themselves and sort of present themselves to the rest of the population of Athens so that they are not felt as an isolated group, thus limiting inequality. And this is done through various art projects which Schedia does. Schedia itself um, gives revenue to uh, the homeless population of Athens by allowing them to circulate the Schedia magazine. Uh, but apart from this, they make various um, art projects such as lamps and uh, vases from the Schedia newspaper itself, which is also a sustainable practice, which connects to our last panel today about sustainable practices and upcycling. All of this has a connection in a sense that inequality in, in the city of Athens and sustainability in the city of Athens can unite in order to create an actual solution and to look forward to the future. Now, I know my teammates already thanked everyone, but I'd also like to thank everyone once again, because it wouldn't be possible for this event to happen without the help of Professor Zahu, without the help of uh, Mrs. Saryotaki, all of these people, as well as the organizing team of live media who helped us be here and actually present to you. Uh, finally, I would like to help. I would like to thank the Millennium Campus Network and the Millennium Fellowship as a whole for inspiring and guiding us for this event, and of course our audience for listening and learning hopefully something. We hope you enjoyed. Thank yes, you. yes. Also, we'd like to mention about our team: uh, um, Dionis Zavaras, uh, co-campus director; me, co-campus director; El. Uh, Eva Dallas, uh, Maria Haji Mikhail, please help me, help me girl with this surname, Nicole Lizu, Ke, uh, Stavrula. Marina Fiatrulu. Uh, yes, yes, yes. All of the team, uh, we are, thank you, all of you. Uh, we are just a team, team effort, teamwork. And again, I would like to thank for all audiences at the, as uh, Barbara mentioned. If you want, I would like to say something. Or closing i think you covered uh the whole oh tommy said okay thank you i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> once again a huge thank you to everyone <laughs> participants uh partners uh in organizing the event um the live stream tech support uh you have been amazing and without all your help and effort, we wouldn't have actually made this uh, wonderful symposium happen. Also, I so, forgot, forgot one name, Vasiliki. You also, I'm a team. Sorry. <laughs> Vasiliki yes. Stefanidi, yay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I also, think that's we the hope you really actually. enjoyed it. Yes. I think I we know. also uh, hope that I this. Covered. Yeah, I hope we hope that this uh, event inspires other institutions to take part in the Millennium Fellowship yes. and uh, further this sort of action in Athens and in Greece and in general. Initiative. Yeah, yeah. This is, we are already as MSN uh, program mentioned is social impact is really important and it can be created with our action with individual and uh, organizational level. We saw that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah.
I think we're good. So I think that is all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Be safe, everyone. Take care uh, in these unprecedented times. And bye bye. <laughs> and, uh, bye, everyone. <laughs>